Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Romans, with this sermon entitled, The Wrath of God Revealed. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. As we uh, continue in Romans, we're kind of going to backtrack just a little bit this morning to start off with kind of as a review of what we talked about last week. Um, But we're finishing up chapter 1 this morning, and so if you will, uh, you can read on the screen, or if you have your your Bibles, we'll be in Romans 1 starting in verse 18. And uh, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so last week we talked about God's general revelation to humanity. And by His general revelation, we looked at how Paul says that in creation, the invisible is made visible, that God's uh, eternal power and divine nature can clearly be seen in nature, in the created world around us, And by eternal power, Paul talked about God's ability to create. And so God speaks creation into existence uh, in Genesis. And so that's His ability to create out of of nothing. And His divine nature, Paul is talking about um, the fact that God has no limitations. And so we we have really big words to describe that. God's uh, omniscience, that He is all wise, that He has all knowledge and, and wisdom that there are no limits to God's knowledge and wisdom. And then God's uh, omnipotence, which means He is all-powerful. There's no limits to God's power, His ability. Um, And so all people, since we have this display of creation around us and we can marvel and awe at the works of God in creation, um, we have no excuse. And so humanity has no excuse. No one can say, "I, I don't deserve judgment. Because we have suppressed the truth, um, we have tried to say, even though I know there is this existence of of a a God that has created us, uh, that has to be uh, transcendent, that has to be higher than we are, 
Um, we have tried to put that God on silence to uh, seek autonomy, independence uh, from Him. And we are, uh, humanity is, is godless, uh, desiring to determine for ourselves often what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. And so Paul says that all people are unrighteous. We often act uh, opposing God's design and purpose, and we often don't do what we should be doing, how God has created us and the purpose He has created us for. We often don't do what we should, and oftentimes we do uh, what we shouldn't be doing. And so both of those are, are sins against our Creator, against God. And Paul is basically saying that there is evidence of humanity's inversion of worship, that we have worshipped worshiped creation rather than the Creator. And so uh, this morning, kids, as we look in your notes, um, idolatry is going to be... Oh, I didn't put it in there. Idolatry is going to be our word for the day. Um, and so Paul is speaking about idolatry, um, and it comes in, in many different forms. We, we often think about idolatry as maybe having a, a statue or a carving or a figure um, that we bow and, and worship to, and, and there are religions that do that. Um, if you remember, uh, one of our mission partners that had spent some time overseas, that when she came back, um, she talked about the gods in the village that she visited and how they um, there was a statue and there were statues of rats uh, around the base of the figure. And so those people prayed to those rats and they thought that the rats would carry up their prayers to their God. And so um, there are people that worship those statues or, or figures of a false god, uh, of a deity. Um, but idolatry is really centering our lives on something or someone other than God. And, and we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that at the end of service. Um, but that thing or that person now becomes our sense of, of purpose. It gives us our, our, our sense of purpose, um, our life meaning, and it, it can become what we crave, what we want to spend our time and money uh, on. It's what uh, influence influences our, our mind or captivates our, our thinking, our thought process. And so it, it can be something that controls uh, how we spend our time, how we spend our, our money, the daily routines that we have um, can be centered on something or someone other than God. And that is um, what Paul is talking about. Uh, that's, that's idolatry. And so since we have this uh, inverted worship where we have worshipped creation rather than creator... Um, God's wrath, Paul says, is being revealed. Um, and so the question now is, is how is God's wrath being revealed? Um, Paul is going to, to talk about God's wrath in these first two chapters in, in two different ways. Um, next week we will see what Paul says about a, uh, a coming day of wrath. Uh, and this is a day when all people will stand before God uh, and be judged. They'll be held accountable for um, how they have lived their life, what their, their thoughts, their deeds, all of those things we will stand accountable before God for one day. And those who do not obey or submit to God uh, and His truth will be punished. And those that do honor God uh, in the work of His Son Jesus, uh, we will have eternal life. And so God, uh, Paul talks about a, a future day of judgment, of, of the wrath of God. Uh, but first, here this morning, he talks about God's wrath as a present reality. He doesn't say God's wrath will be revealed. He says it's, it's being revealed now. And so we want to look at that this morning. He, he doesn't mention um, really earthquakes or tsunamis or, or natural disasters, although that can be part of, of God's wrath. Uh, but three times, Paul says, God gave them up. And so Paul is associating God's wrath with this giving up or handing over uh, that God does. And this is God removing Himself, um, removing His restraint, removing His grace on people's lives. And, and basically, it, it's when we say, I, I don't want anything to do with God, 
Um, I, I want to live independent. I want to, to make my own rules. I want to live life as I see fit. And Paul says, the wrath of God is that he says, okay, you, you want me out of the picture? So be it. So God hands us over to our own desires, our own way of thinking, um, our own consequences of our actions. And we can see where God does this in the Old Testament. If you think back to our study in Exodus, um, God sent ten plagues uh, upon Egypt to Pharaoh. Um, and after each plague, Pharaoh had an opportunity to repent. Pharaoh had an opportunity to say, uh, I submit to the God of Israel. Um, I'll, I'll do what he asks. But we see that Pharaoh's heart becomes increasingly hardened. His heart becomes increasingly calloused and he refuses time after time um, to do what God has asked him to do in letting his people go uh, to worship him. He, he says, I, I'm not going to submit. I am Pharaoh. And remember, Pharaoh viewed himself as, as a deity. He viewed himself as um, a representative of their, their gods and their Egyptian religion. And even at one point, Pharaoh says, Who is Yahweh? Who is the Lord that I should submit to Him? I, I don't know this God. I don't recognize this God. I don't acknowledge this God's power and authority um, over my life. And so, um, before the, the final plague, it's if you remember when Moses stands before Pharaoh, Pharaoh pretty much says, Get out of my presence. This is the last time you're going to see my face. And God says, so be it. And he sends the tenth plague uh, to Egypt and leads e Israel out of Egypt. Um, but, but I was thinking about that when I was studying this morning. And that is, we, we get that picture and we, we get that story, but I think we kind of miss being sympathetic for Pharaoh and those Egyptian people because when we read that, for, for a time, God was in Egypt. You think about that. God's presence was in Egypt, but they said, no, we, we don't want anything to do with that God. That's, that's so sad. But God says that's what humanity has, has done to God. He, he, we've seen His evidence of Him in creation. We have His Word, but so many people say, I, I don't want anything to do with that. And so part of God's wrath is saying, okay, you, you go your own way and see how that turns out for you. Another example that we see in the Old Testament is King Saul. If you remember, he is the uh, first king of Israel that, that God appoints. And um, externally, he, he looked like he had his act together. He was taller than the other people. He looked physically strong. He, he looked like he would be a, a good candidate to be the king of Israel. But when Saul became king, it doesn't take him long to show that he is not a good candidate because he doesn't want to listen to God's voice. When God gives him instructions, he chooses to, to do things his own way and even has good intentions about how he does things, but he, he doesn't do the things the way that God wants. And so we get some very sad news when Samuel comes to, to talk to Saul. He says, because you've done this, he says, now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And so Saul sinned, and he faced the consequences of his sin. And after God departed from him, um, he eventually kind of goes mad. If you know the story, you know how he um, kind of became obsessed with, with keeping his kingdom. He, he clung to it. He did everything within his power to, to hang on to his rule and reign over Israel, even though God said, I'm going to replace you. And so there were people that Saul tried to, to get killed just to, to keep his power. And his heart becomes increasingly uh, darker over time as, he, uh, as God's spirit departed from him. And so these are, are really frightening words from Paul that if we continually choose to suppress God's truth, if we continually, um, like we take out our phones and, and put our text messages and our, our ringer on silence, we, we've tried to do that to God. And if we continue uh, living in a life that does that, eventually God will leave us to our own 
demise. He'll leave us to our own destructive vices and choices to pursue our own desires. And there will be consequences for our actions um, because God has given us the best way to live. He's given us guidelines and instructions in His Word, and we've said no to that. And so there's going to be consequences. A lot of people get uncomfortable when we talk about um, God's wrath or the, the anger of God. Um, we fail to remember that God's anger is motivated by His love. Um, I, I think in our culture and society today, we, we often feel that um, love and anger are contradictory, that, that, that they can't have anything to do with each other. We think of them as, as opposites, but love and, and anger are not opposites. Um, James, in his letter, says to be angry and do not sin. Sometimes anger is warranted. We can be angry about um, bad things happening that are unjust, that are wrong. We can be angry about evil in society around us. If we think about this with God, if God never got angry at the evil deeds that we have seen throughout history, if God never um, got angry about rape, if He never got angry about uh, murder or slavery or human trafficking or greed or oppression and injustice, then He would not be a loving God. None of us would say He is loving. We would say He's apathetic. We would say He's unconcerned, that He's unfit that he's unjust, and we would probably describe him as evil if he just turned his head away from all of these things and said, I'm not concerned with that. Live life how you want to live. But because God is loving, all sin, all evil warrants his anger and his punishment. And so because God is love, he's going to, to do something about the evil that we see in our world today. He is going to do something about injustices that we see. None of us in our lives, none of us sin inside a, a vacuum. Our sin affects ourselves. Our sin affects other people. When we think about things that we see in the, the Bible described as sin, um, we know that lust can destroy marriages, that it can leave a, that lust can leave someone scarred for life, to carry something that happened to them in the past with them for years and years to come because lust is devastating. We know that greed can destroy someone's career, that it can destroy families when someone uh, puts the idea of, of accumulating more and more wealth up at the top of, of their desires at the expense of their family at home. Or they put that desire of, of money so high that they're willing to compromise their character and, and maybe take funds that don't belong to them or, or make shady uh, business decisions just so they can, can get more. And it can be devastating to people's lives. We know that gossip can destroy friendships when people are, are talking about others behind uh, the backs of, of someone they're friends with. And when the truth comes to light that those relationships are, are often broken or they're hurt and they have to be mended. So all of these things that Paul is, is going to mention as we get towards going through this list that he has for us, all of them impact our relationship with, with God. All of them impact our, uh, can impact our own physical, mental, emotional uh, being, and they can impact the people that we love uh, around us. And so uh, Paul is drawing our attention to those things. His intention is not that we would ask, what kind of God is this? What kind of God is it that, get angry, that gets angry at people for doing wrong? That's not his intention. And his intention is not for us to come away from this, from, from reading his letter and saying, yes, God is mad at those people. His intent is that we would say, what kind of person am I? That we would do self-evaluation and say, how have I personally, how have I hurt or offended or sinned against my Creator? It's so that we would realize that we are all guilty. That we all warrant punishment. That we all warrant God's anger because of how we live, how we think, what our desires are. And Paul says, since humanity 
has now moved from not just suppressing the truth, but exchanging it for a lie. Now God is going to hand them over to pursue that lie. That's part of his judgment. And so Paul gives some examples of how humans have violated God's created order. And first he is going to talk about all forms of sexual impurity and sexual immorality. And so this has to do with with all forms of that impurity. It has to do with lust. It has to do with uh, pornography, with premarital sex, with adultery. Uh, Those are desires and sins that dishonor, he says, our our bodies. And in 1 Corinthians, he, he uses very similar language. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So this is when we see people as uh, not image bearers of God, but we begin to see people as a means to satisfy an appetite, a means to satisfy some kind of, of pleasure. And so it can be when we make someone just another face, uh, just another experience that we're having, uh, just another, um, maybe if you remember in high school, you, you might have talked about notches in your, your belt. Um, it's when we belittle those image bearers of God and see them just as a, a means to our own pleasure. And not only do we use the, that person, but we don't fully give ourselves to that person in a, a loving commitment, a, a loving covenant relationship. We're saying, in effect, that I only want this part of you. The rest I could care less about. I just want this. No strings attached just for some momentary pleasure. That dishonors God's design that we find at the the beginning. In creation, He made them male and female to be united in marriage, that they would leave their father and mother and become one flesh. And so God is talking about the the complementary, that two pieces are, are becoming whole. And it's more than just something that happens physically. Those two people are supposed to empower each other, to help each other. They're supposed to encourage each other. They're supposed to be enjoyed by one another. Again, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It's, it's giving yourself and being in a covenant relationship with that one other person. And this violation of God's crea- created order is... Sadly, more obvious with homosexuality. Paul doesn't use that word here, but it is what he is describing. Um, You you can't say this is something other than homosexuality that he is speaking against. It's not uh, pedestry. It's not men and and boys. Um, Paul says it is men committing shameless acts with men, just like women have exchanged their natural physical function for something else. And this was not foreign to Paul. Uh, This was actually pretty common in Paul's day. It's not a new invention. It's not something that we have just arrived at recently. In fact, uh, Emperor Nero, who lived during Paul's day, possibly at the time of of this writing, um, he had been married to to two men. He had two different husbands. So Paul is, again, saying that this is against nature. It's against God's created order. It's unnatural. It's improper. Um, Anything outside of of God's design in marriage between a man and a woman. uh, He's saying that it is not complementary now. And that is very evident not only in our uh, physiology, um, but it's also evident in, in biology. And there are consequences, Paul will say, to all forms of sexual immorality. Um, There are consequences when humanity chases and pursues those desires. And he says that those who practice these things will receive in themselves the due penalty for their error. Paul doesn't give us specifics of of what that is. It could be um, that he is talking about guilt here, uh, that people, when we we do those things, that our conscience is seared, that we, we feel guilt, we know that what we have done is, is wrong. And so we might have mental anxiety or there may be stress or uh, there may be depression. 
Um, he could be talking about how this affects relationships and how marriages are ruined, how relationships are affected, how families are split up because of sexual sins. It could be that Paul is referring to um, sexually transmitted diseases that will happen um, when we do things outside of, of God's design. Um, this week, as I was studying and preparing, I, I went back and kind of found something that I had heard before that um, it was really shocking to me. Um, but in the 1950s, uh, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, only knew of two major sexually transmitted diseases. It wasn't until the 1960s and the free love movement that that number began to increase, and it increased rapidly. Today, there are more than 30 different bacteria, viruses, and parasites that are transmitted primarily through sexual contact. It could very well be that Paul is thinking of these as consequences to suppressing the truth to exchanging the truth for a lie, and from deviating from God's uh, created order. And so Paul is, is saying that as we suppress God's voice, we're exchanging truth for lies. And so God's purpose and intent for humanity, uh, as we sin, as we suppress God's truth, as we put His voice and His word on silent, uh, humanity continues to slowly degrade and devolve and dissolve. Um, sadly, today we see this happening faster than it has ever happened before. And we are bombarded with voices that are trying to suppress God's truth. Voices that are, are trying to redefine what God has established in the covenant of marriage. Voices that are trying to blur the lines between reality and fantasy. And as we talk about uh, the transgender movement, Voices that demand not acceptance, not tolerance, but what they really demand is affirmation. They want someone to say, you're right. What you say and what you are desiring, what life you're pursuing, you're, you're right in doing that. As Christians, we can love those people, um, but we don't have to uh, believe what they believe. Um, we live in America, we live in a democracy, and, and people are free to make their own choices. You're, you're free to live your life however you want, with whatever God you want. So you're free to participate in those things. As Christians, we, we don't have to hate people that disagree with us. We don't have to hate them. We, we want to love them because God loves them. And the biggest evidence of that, guys... God gave His Son to forgive and restore those people. All people. Because we're, we're, it's level ground at the cross. Right? Again, Paul is not pointing this out and saying this is the most atrocious thing. He's just saying this is where it's evident because it's contrary to nature. But he's going to list a whole lot more for us. And, and, and it's going to step on all of our toes. Because we're all sinners that deserve God's punishment. But God sent His Son because He loves us. He loves them. And so we, we don't want to hate them. We want to love them. But at the same time, guys, we don't have to celebrate that sin. And that's, that's very important today in our, our churches that we see that we don't have to celebrate that sin, that they are celebrating. We, we want to stand on God's Word and say, you're free to do what you want to do. But if we want God's best way, if we want to do things how God designed it, if we want to, to live lives that lead to flourishing, then we're going to listen to the One who made us, who designed us, who created us. In love, He sent His Son to forgive all who confess and believe. But at the same time, we all have to take up our cross. And uh, uh, what's the lady's name, Amanda, that wrote that book? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Is it the... Hold on. I don't have my phone. Anyway, um, there's a book. It's called Good Gir um, Gay Girl, Good God. And it is um, about a lady's um, living in 
lesbianism and, and she resisted God and she found God later in life and God saved her and, and she had to reject lesbianism. Um, she had to, she thought she was going to live a, a celibate life and that's what she knew she had to do. She had to take up her cross and do things God's way. Um, eventually she did find a husband. It doesn't always work like that, but that's, that's what happened with her. But in that book, um, she said, she, she recognized that God calls us to take up our cross. And she said something that I'll never forget. She said, but some crosses are heavier than others. And there's a lot of truth in that. But we're all called to take up our cross, to die to self, to lay down our lives and follow God. And so we can and should love, but we don't have to cheer for sin. And again, Paul is not just talking about homosexuality. Um, hear me, church. We need to stand for sexual purity according to God's design in our relationships as well. Guys, ladies, we need to be committed in our marriages to our spouse. We need to hold that covenant as, as sacred. That it's not how we feel, but it is a covenant that we have made before a holy God to love and be with that person in our marriage. We need to stand for sexual purity um, when we talk to our kids about their identity, about what God's design is. And we need to do that sooner rather than later because, again, there are other voices out there that are trying to suppress the truth. So we need to give them the truth as parents in our conversations. And then finally, I'll just throw this out there. Men, ladies, um, if you have an addiction to pornography, get help. That's not God's design. That's not His way. There is a better way. So we need to take those sexual sins, all of them, very seriously and hold those um, in honor before God. And Paul is going to continue just in case um, you think he's not talking to you. And this is where, you know, we, we really say, ouch. Um, Paul says, if we worship someone or something other than God, it degrades, it dehumanizes us. But we are all guilty. We're all capable of some manner of unrighteousness. And so he goes through this list, and I'll just kind of go down through it. Um, he talks about wickedness, and that is perverting virtue for unjust gain. So this is... Um, someone needs help, I, yeah, I'll help them out because now they will owe me. It's not just because you want to help them out. It's because you, you want them to be indebted to you. Um, I'll pretend to be their friend for a while so I can catch them in something and, and call them out in front of everybody because you really you don't want to be their friend. You want to catch them and um, make life worse for them. It talks about covetousness or greed, the desire for not only more, it's, it's really a desire for excess, more than enough. It talks about malice. This is acting with intent to harm or damage someone or someone's reputation. He says uh, envy is included in the list. And this is, um, I, I think we could all say out to this, sometimes we, we're guilty of this. It's, it's resentment at someone else's success. That's what envy is. It's when we see someone else succeed and, and we're jealous. We're envious of that success. He talks about murder. And, and of course, this is the act of taking someone's life um, out of hatred. But again, um, Jesus talks about the heart attitudes that we have. That We may not necessarily be guilty of taking someone's life, but in our heart we may wish someone were dead. And I'll never forget um, Scott, you spoke about this one Sunday morning and you said that to, to hate someone and to think about murder in your heart is when we look at someone and say, my life would be better if you did not exist. Are we guilty of that? Are we guilty of saying my life would be better if you did not exist? He talks about strife and this is bitterness in our hearts. This is holding grudges against people that may have wronged us instead of trying to reconcile things. He talks about deceit, and this is being crafty um, at deception. This is tricking someone, um, not telling the whole truth, um, being deceitful in, in, in purchases and, and buying and um, those kind of things. It's, it's 
uh, being deceitful. He talks about gossip or, or slander and it's spreading rumors to belittle someone. Being haughty or, or boastful. So this is being puffed up with, with pride and arrogance. Having a, a greater estimation of yourself than, than what's true. Um, he talks about being disobedience to parents. Um, this is not respecting those who are in authority over us. Um, not respecting their instruction. He talks about being ruthless or unmerciful. Not, not cutting one, someone any slack. Having no compassion for someone. And so again, if you, if you go through this list, guys, if you read this and says, something doesn't sting inside of you, read it again. And if it still doesn't, read it again. Because Paul is, is talking about all of us and things that we all do, things that we all experience in our lives. This is Paul dropping the bad news that everyone is guilty and, and yes, some sins are more visible, more obvious. But his main point is that all have sinned. And then he's going to be able to give us the good news. That Jesus came and died so that we could be forgiven. Jesus came to save sinners. And so the God of anger is a God of love. He is merciful. He is gracious. And we're going to talk about that more next week as well. And so Paul's point is don't. Don't continue to reject God and, and push Him away. I guess we could look at Jesus' parable in Luke. I think it's Luke 18. Um, Jesus gives us the parable of the uh, publican and the Pharisee. And, and Paul's point here is, is kind of like what Jesus said, is, is don't be like that Pharisee. The Pharisee went out to pray one day and he said, Oh God, thank you Then I am not like that person. Thank you that I've been a good person. Thank you that I've had my act together since I was young. Thank you that I'm, I'm not like them. And the publican came out and he, he beat his breast. He said, God, be merciful to me because I'm a sinner. Paul wants us to see that this morning. That what we rely on is God's mercy and grace in our lives and so that we should all say, God, be merciful to me because I'm just like them. I'm just like them. I've rebelled against you. I've sinned against you. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Kids, um, we'll talk about this and then we'll close. Um, when we talk about idolatry and Think about what that is. I've got an illustration here that I wanted to, to share with you. Um, Paul is telling us that as our Creator, God deserves to be first in our lives. And when we talk about God being at the center, that our, th our thinking, the things that we do, um, God should be um, at the center, affecting all of that. Um, especially if we, we know Him because our lives are empty and, and God fills our lives. So this water is, is like God filling our lives and God being at the, the center of our lives and everything that we do. In Proverbs, it says children, in 321, it says children, do not lose sight of these. It's talking about God's promises and who God is. And it says don't lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion and they will be life for you, life for your soul and an adornment for your neck. And then you will walk in your own way securely and your feet will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. That's a good verse for us adults. That we don't have to carry the guilt and the shame that we can lay down and sleep sweetly. Because God has forgiven us. Because of what Jesus has done. But kids, when we talk about God and our lives centering on God, if we know Him, our, our hearts are full of His goodness. But other things can crowd out God from our lives. Can push God away. And so when I, I first got here this morning, I thought about doing this illustration all week. And 
I was going to, to get Justin and, and Cadence. We went outside and I was going to use rocks. And I thought, I can't do that. Because a lot of the things that we fill our, our lives with, they're not ugly like rocks. They're, they're pretty. And they're good things. Like, you think about sports and you think about school and you think about money. All those things are necessary. All of those things are, are, are fun. They're good. And, and God created us to be able to think of fun games to play. He created us to have hobbies to do and to, to work for money, to be able to buy food. And, and all of those things are, are good. Um, and so we can add some of those. And so we might think about, okay, I uh, play some baseball on the weekends. Um, I have a basketball team that I'm part of or the football team or I cheer. Or, and we think about, okay, I, I work and get an allowance. And one day... I'm going to go get a job somewhere, and so I'm going to go to college and, and you know, do that, and that's that's really good. And, you know, maybe I, I play some video games on the weekend or at night sometimes, and, and I spend some time doing that, and, and that's good. And maybe I, I play with my friends some at school, and when we go places, and we, we hike, and we camp, and all of those things are good. And so we can fit those things in there. But idolatry is when we say, that's good, I, I want to do that more. I want to I do that thing more. I want to go after that thing more. And hopefully you can see what, what's happening. We're pushing God out of our lives. And that's, that's idolatry. And so those things that we do, those things that we're involved with, that are, that are good things, sometimes we can make those things ultimate Things. Those can be the things that we want to, to put all of our attention on. All of our time doing, all of our money spent pursuing those things, and we end up kind of pushing God away. And so Paul wants us to be aware of, of idolatry and how that uh, affects our lives. And so I wanted to share that. I think that's a good illustration, even for us adults, is how we can fill our lives with so much that we, we push God out of it. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, our time together this morning. We thank you for your word, and most of all, we thank you for your love. Because none of us deserve it, and you give it willingly, and you give it abundantly. And so, God, we, we praise your name. As we sang this morning, God, we, we praise your name for who you are and what you have done for us. And God, help us to stay on the firm foundation that is that is your word. Help us to, to share the gospel, the good news with our friends, our neighbors, our family, our children. God, continue to be with our mission partners as they try to do the same to unreached people groups. God, it's all about you. And, um, there's nothing more that we could do that is... Uh, more glorious than share who you are with other people and uh, help us to to follow you um, help us as we make decisions as we have our hobbies and, and things God just give us discernment and, and show us if there are things that we need to, to lay down so we can pursue you more in Jesus name we pray amen